Well, time we were together, I saw how Paul rejoiced in his sufferings and that every believer has to come to terms with that. Jesus said, uh, if they persecute me, they're going to persecute the hate. Get it through your head. All who live God. Now, obviously, it's what much of the world and grace God. In some way or, or form, Hated, faith back down. Chapter five today, which I became a minister to the body of Christ, was called self minister. It's, it's literally a Greek word that means the way person who works in the field or the Paul says, I am a servant of yours. I may be an apostle, but with that in my mind, servant of all. He said the greatest in his kingdom are going to be who? Those who have served the Lord and the most. And he sees this as a stewardship. He says, which I Apostle, I always make myself a servant according to the stewardship which God has given to me for you to fulfill the word of God, namely, minister to help the church in sanctification. So, which meant he goes to places that have never heard about, goes in a world of all kinds of. People come, he takes off, so to speak, puts on the minister hat, and now he work the grind work of just helping people grow in Christ and learn to give themselves to God willingly. Comfort is a friend of mine who's an evangelist. He said the longest ten years. For six months. It's a, it's a shepherd. His job isn't ex- grass, walk him slow to the water, walk him back to the grass, walk him back in the crowd. Takes uh, eight, ten hours. Uh, and uh, And even evenings, I, I would counsel, and one after the next hour, and uh, I'd have to counsel. I can do one a week, but I can do three in a row. And how do you do that? It's like, I, I don't know. I'm just a turtle, you know. I just uh, am slow, grind it out, and there's grace to do it. And, and Paul had to learn that he had to become box with the sheep, and it helps them grow. In sanctification, still calls himself interested, which is somebody who willingly makes himself a slave for the rest of the life, and that's a teaching for another time. But he was a doula, a servant. It's shit from God. Which God has given me. So this this is not a choice. This is God saying, Paul, wash these feet until all of them are clean. Paul, be a waiter and serve these people until they are fully fed. And so at that point, I had to become something that just tedious and constant and daily looking at and the word, and the counseling, and, and, and it was a stewardship. I had to be faithful to this. 
Uh, the actual word uh, stewardship, akinoi, uh, it, it comes from the uh, oak house. It's house manager, somebody overseeing the house. I've got to oversee the church that got started. Got to build up leaders and over to them. And talks about this, that this was the one that he knew on the day of judgment, he was going to have to give an account. Let a man, he says in 1 Corinthians 4, 1 through 5, let a man so consider us servants of Christ, stewards of God, and stewards of God. Moreover, it's required of a, stu- of a s- steward this one thing, to be faithful, to keep doing it daily, daily, daily. The master says you're no longer to do. As for, far as you guys judging me, whether I am being a master or not, I don't care about your judgment. I don't care what you think of me. And far as judging myself, it, because I'm uh, incorrect. You know, people can also judge somebody, but then when they do the same thing, they want mercy and they give themselves mercy. We often uh, sometimes are harder on ourselves than other people. You, you gave grace to that person. Why are you yourself? We often get so wrong. So it says in 1 Corinthians 4, therefore, before the time, until the Lord comes, who will both bring to light the hidden things of darkness and reveal the counsels of the hearts. And then he says this, that each one's praise will come from God. And so when I stand before God, the main thing is I've been faithful with what I have. When often I, I read this, I had somebody even mention this last week. They, I see that I always pay for with the money. And I'm like, well, that, that's also a part of it. You know, I think in our lifetime, God's going to say, your lifetime, uh, man, you've handled X amount of money. $3 million went through your And... This is how much you tithed. This is how much you gave above the tithe. This is how you tithe. And I'm going to have to But I think equally so, time, right? I think equally so, my wife washing her. And of course, those who teach get a severe judgment. Was I faithful? And t- Breaks down to a lot of things, but it really does come down to faithfulness. Faithfulness in this area, faithfulness in that. It's all of it to have character. You know, that's character, isn't it? I mean, character is being able to do the right thing, even though everyone's screaming doing the right thing, right? Sometimes you're just, oh, it's so hard. And then to do it every day, all day, every day, all day. We're all having to beat our bodies into subjection at times. But being that consistent person is something where God is trying to form us in. And we go through every type of, through every type of ups and downs, but we are still in the word. We're still praying. We're still fellowshipping, uh, going to church. We're, we're still sharing our faith. We're still loving the Lord with all our heart. That's... That's it. And we all, that's it. Jesus said, if you try this year, this next 365 days, no, nope, it's just today. We lay our head on the pillow tonight. Was I faithful with what God's given me? Today? In particular, to fulfill the word of God, that the fullness of the word of God would be in his and in others to complete that work. Paul talks about it in Acts. He pastored in Ephesus. He he talks about how harsh it was on him. In Acts 20, verse 20, says, Move me, nor did I count my life dear to myself, so that I raised with joy the ministry of Jesus, testified to the God of God. And indeed, you all among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God will see my face no more. Therefore, I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of the Lord. Why? For I have not shunned to declare the whole counsel of God. 
fulfill feeding the sheep three years Paul in 2 Timothy finished the race I've kept the faith. and now not only for me but to love his appearing there there's ministers of God well, in verse 26 now, the mystery which from ages and from Jesus, but now revealed to his saints. We talked about this in depth in Ephesians 2. The mystery the riddle is not a shock. It's just simply a dispensation that you had to wait for for that dispensation of time. There were certain revelations about the Messiah. Austin Rose again is explaining a lot abundantly clear. And now after he's risen from the dead, you look back and you're going, I see it. What God's plan was. Excuse me, my mouth is very dry today for some reason. But um, this is uh, knowledge built. It's it's so many different people. You can attribute it to me. Um, in the Old Testament, concealed, New Testament, a certain point in do- makes the unknowable knowable. These are unknowable. is now a revelation to believers. So it's hidden in ages and generations past. Now it's been revealed. David Guzik says it so well. The specific mystery Paul refers to here deals with many aspects of the work of Jesus and his people, but especially the plan of the church to make one body out of the Jews and Gentiles taken from the trunk of Israel, yet not Israel. The church is a part of Israel, but yet not Israel. And it's been now revealed to the saints. You guys remember in Romans where Paul says that in Romans 4 it isn't about the actual nationality of Jews that make them a Jew. It's not physical. It's by the the physical nation of Israel but those have the faith of Abraham. So Isaac did have that faith of Abraham. Esau and Jacob, Esau didn't, Jacob did. And so it says now everyone who has faith of Abraham is the child of Abraham. Romans 4.16 was the father of us all. And then he talks about in Romans 11 how we a wild olive, but we've been grafted the natural branch of Israel. And that Israel for a time has been broken off because they would not receive the love of the truth. They would not the Messiah. So that branch for now is broken off. And what's grafted in right now is all who are willing to follow Jesus. Jews or Gentiles, it's, it's irrelevant because we all become children of Abraham, if you would, the true nation of Israel through faith in Jesus. But then he makes it clear at the end, part, the last part of Romans 11, don't despise the nation of Israel as the nation of Israel. There's God is not given up on them. And so when the rapture happens, God's focus on the last seven years in the tribulation period is going to be on the nation of Israel. It's about 144,000 uh, evangelists, 12,000 from each of the tribes of Israel, two witnesses, Jews, and in, in the wall they, that lived for three and a half years rebuking the works of the Antichrist. It's about the salvation of Israel uh, at, in the three and a half year period when they reject the Antichrist and the Antichrist tries to murder them. So he makes it clear that this blindness in part, this dispensation of time 
from Jesus' resurrection till the rapture, this blindness to the Jews, the veil over their eyes, has happened until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. When there is a point in time where God says, my focus is no longer on the whole world's salvation, but on saving the nation of Israel. So if you look in the Bible about who the elect is, clearly the nation of Israel is God's elect, and Jesus is God's elect, and I say the church is also God's elect, but the church really is one with the nation of Israel. We, we are all grafted into that national uh, lineage of Abraham by our faith of Abraham. So it really comes back to just one elect. It's all those who have the faith of Abraham are God's elect. And those who walk in is God's elect. And then, of course, Jesus, the Messiah, is God's elect, the head, the king of Israel, of the church. Hey, read that with me, verse 3 to 6. Now that by revelation he made known to me the mystery, as I have briefly written already, by which you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery which is in other ages, not made known to the sons of men, but has now been revealed by the Spirit and his holy apostles and prophets, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body and particular in Christ through the gospel. Fellow heirs with all the rest of uh, Israelis throughout history who have had the faith of Abraham. And, uh, and now we are complete uh, in that lineage. And we are called the church, but nevertheless, uh, we want to pray for the nation of Israel. We want to pray for the peace in Jerusalem. They are God's chosen people. God never unchooses them. That's really the point. The point of Israel, as much as anything, is to show nature. And what he begins all the way to the end of times, till the end of the tribulation period, he finishes. All Israel will be saved. Israel will come back to God. For a thousand years, he has just the nation of Israel. And from Jerusalem, he rules and reigns as king and the with them. How do we learn that who God chooses, those who have the faith of Abraham become God never stops until he is successful to get them who his kingdom he takes a trip if he reigned as who those are have the faith of Israel. God will not stop till the end. Us as Christians, in the middle of that, going, wow, if that's God's nature towards a rebellious Israel, how much more that is true of us who believe in the Lord. Right? Well, verse 27. To them God willed to make known what are the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles. Glory. That phrase, guy, probably one of the phrases in the Bible. Christ in you, the hope of glory. This is history that Christ is in you. I mean, we understood that as we looked that God was going to be a light, come and be a light, but to the Gentiles. But did we understand the depth of what it means, Christ? In Remember in Jeremiah 30, he said, there's going to be a new covenant with the nation of Israel, or we know now as the church, and all who have become the nation of Israel, all who have the faith of Abraham. And he says in Jeremiah 31, 33 to 34, but this is that covenant, this new covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law into their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be God. They shall be my people. No more shall every man 
Say, teach his neighbor, every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to them, says the Lord. Love this last line, for I will forgive their iniquity, and their sin I will remember no The mystery is now revealed that we see it. Spirit circumcise our heart. It's his truth in our hearts. Jesus said you can get rid of all except this. Love the Lord with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, right? And love your neighbor as yourself. When you read the Gospel of John, Jesus says it several times. A new commandment I give you that you love one another as I've loved you. A new commandment I give you that have you much Jesus says the Father loved me? This is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Will that love and me now I now this is the new commandment. I'm gonna put you back under the law. Just love one another as I have loved you. By this the world will know you're my disciples by your love for one another. And so this is the hope of glory. Again, you've heard me say this many times that the word hope in the Greek is not the same in English today. The word hope in the Greek is a certainty. It's not if it might happen today. That's an if, you know. No, no, no. This is a, it's a certainty. It is going to happen, but how glorious is going to be. Man, we are going to see the glory of the Lord. You know what? I, this week, you know, as you're sort of waking up or awake, you, you have those, those things. And of course, I, I, I hate summertime for the reason that it takes so long to get to September for football season to start. <laughs> and, and they talk about it and talk about it and it hurts. And they start showing the past year's great and watch old football games and, and they'll say football and you're, oh, football, it's, it's July. Oh, you know, from 1920 or 2020, there was this great game. And, and, it, and it, it aches. And then finally, last Thursday night comes. <laughs> uh, the Rams lost. Horrible story, but the football season, I got to get home today and watch football. I'm sorry. You're, you're first, Lord. <laughs> but I'll tell you what, I was in that moment. And, you know, that song we sang today about the Lion of Judah. And at the same time, they saw a lamb as though he had been slain. And everybody in heaven began to open the scroll. And weeping, and finally they say, the lamb who is slain is worthy to open the scroll. And that scene where all the multitude of people of every tribe, of nation, of of people, are there praising the Lord. The elders are casting their crowns before the throne. Looking upon Jesus, the seraphim and the seraphim are flying around and all the angels singing along with all those who have been and raptured with the Lord. You know, I read that, I've taught that, but I'm telling you, all season's coming. (laughs) I'm telling you, in heaven, next to one another, and we're going to be happening. Oh, Jesus, you see that? We're here. You know the song, right? It's in Revelation. You are worthy. You are alone. Jesus, we glory and honor and power. Guys, it's we are in the end times. The spirit of the Antichrist is in the world. Good is evil, and evil is good. I was talking to my friend Brian Parrish this week. He goes, been pastors for 40 years, and we knew it was going to be good's evil, but we didn't think it was going to be listed. I was and this 
for this little, little six-year-old boy's birthday, bought him some princess shoes, you know, the little cheap ones. He never takes them, he even sleeps in them. He's, this little boy's dancing around the house in his princess shoes, and, and she's like, oh, it's, this is the best day of my life. My son's finally finding his identity. It, it's just weird. I mean, okay, be evil. Uh, that's fine. But don't be so disgusting, weird, creepy. We didn't get it. Just the Antichrist is not evil. He's creepy. He's sexually twisted. And I think that's what Noah saw in the day of Noah. I think that's what Lot saw in the day of Sodom and Gomorrah. And, it, and it's just like, oh, man, we thought it would be exciting before the rapture comes and we're out preaching the gospel and, and people tell the, the the last of the Jews are coming in, the last of the Gentiles are getting saved, how exciting this is and woo, and then we're raptured out. but it's like, oh my take a shower I, you know, I'm watching this simple, enjoyable show and then two guys are kissing oh my gosh, what is going on here I can just tell you, Andy is still doing well in Mayberry RFD, okay? So thank God for, for those good old shows. And Dragnet, they're solving, solving crimes to this day. Oh, there is a watch still. But either way, we are confident, even though these are hard times, to wrestle through, and probably for the first time for Western Christians, we are going to suffer what those have in the East and the, the, great, the Far East and the Middle East have experienced their whole lives, and that is, it's going to cost you to be. You want Bible studies in your homes. People are going to turn you into the police for talking about Jesus to them. In school, and if you wear the wrong kind of shirt or wear the wrong kind of hat, you're going to suffer from it. Yes, it's okay. Then we'll have a ministry, right? David Guzik says this, The truth which was now made known is that the Lord lives and resides within us. It is clear from the Old Testament that the it was not revealed that he would abide in us and we in him. Isn't that amazing? We know the Lord raised from the dead, he's breathed in John 20 and they received the Holy Spirit. And then in John 14, 15, 16, it talks about how the Holy Spirit and he's going to be our comforter. He's going to be our teacher. He's going to take the things of Christ and teach it to us. Equally, the Father lives in us. And Jesus, one Lord. And we learn that the entirety of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit are free in us. Ephesians 1 says it's the down payment, <laughs> it's the guarantee of our being with the Lord. He has marked us with his ownership. We are owned by him. Jesus prayed this. You've heard me pray it many times. It's one of the most exciting passages to me. But in, in John 17, 13, but now I can, and these things I speak in the world that they may have, listen, my joy. Fulfilled in themselves. Jesus wants you to have joy in this world. I want my joy to be in you. Why in this world? And he explains, starting in verse 20, all the way to verse 26. I do not pray for these alone. He's talking about us, guys. But also for those who believe in me through their word. That's us. Jesus is praying for us 2,000 years in advance. That they all may be one as you, Father, are in 
me and I in you, that they also may be one, how? In us. That the world may be one. The me, I've given them the glory that you've given me, I've given to them. That they may be one, just as one. I in them. Yay! You in me, that they may be made perfect in one. The world is complete because he lives in us. That the world may know that and have loved them in me. Father, I desire that you gave me with me where I am, that they may behold my glory which you have given me. Lord, I can't wait for that Revelation 4 and 5 uh, chapters to happen, that they would see it. The glory is as well as ours. And you had loved me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, the world's not known you, but I have known you, and these have known that you sent me. I have declared to them your name. I will declare it, that the love with which you love me may be in them. And what? I in them. He goes on to say, God willed to make known what are the riches of the glory. So I want to be you to be in. But then I want them right. And now I, I want them to every day unwrap a new fresh present. And that present is the glory of God. I'll tell you, after having been a Christian for, I don't know, 50 years, that is getting When I read the Bible, it's more glory. I am seeing Jesus clear. In prayer, it's intimate. What I'm powerful. I'm experiencing a love I did not know when I was 20. <laughs> for my family, for all of you. God wants the riches of his glory. Paul said it in 1 Corinthians 2, 9. Eye is not seen, ear is not heard, nor is even entered into the things which In 2 Corinthians 12, Paul talks about experience. He said, I don't know if I actually went there or I, was, I saw it in a vision or I was translated there, but I'm telling you, I was in heaven. And in this experience, I can't tell you one thing. Because he says, if I tried to put in our human language what I saw in heaven, I would be sinning. It would be unlawful. Wow. Guys, eyes not seen, ears not heard, and you can't hear it <laughs> because it's too glorious to speak in anything but in the language uh, of heaven, the language of angels, the language of heaven. He goes on in verse 28 to say, we preach, warning every man, teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every in Christ, Him is Jesus. I'm not organized. Well, if you want to be right with God, you got to go to the Watchtower Society. You got to be a Jehovah Witness. You got to be a Mormon. You got to be a Catholic. You got to be a Baptist. You got to be a Lutheran. You got to be, you, you got to, you know, it's not about just you being the Lord, but it's you showing up on Sunday at church. And, and I can let everybody know that I took you out of the darkness and into our organization. Anytime somebody tells you right with their organization to be with God, it's a cult. <laughs> Jesus never did that. On the cross, he didn't say, okay, make sure you move this to Rome and make sure the priest, you know, make, make sure the, the Pope has a giant poobah hat. And at least 50 pounds of gold. It's big ring. It's, it's insane to think that the little carpenter from Nazareth who preached in Galilee wanted that. 
no matter how glorious it might look to us. Jesus is it. I can go and preach Jesus to Christ. If they ask me, I'll say, I, this is where I go to church. I'm the pastor there. Here, here's some information. But if they don't, I don't tell them. Because I don't want to, you know, muddy up the waters. I, I want them to just see. It's you, about you coming to Jesus. It's about you knowing Jesus. And that's it. Salvation is him. Whoever believes in the only begotten son, that person will never perish. That person will have everlasting life. It's not whoever believes in the son, Jesus, and, and you start down the religion. There is no end. It's just the one thing. Him, we preach Jesus. In Hebrews 10, verse 5 through 7, it says, Therefore he came into the world, and he said, Sacrifice and offerings you do not desire heard for me and burnt offerings and sacrifice her sins you had no pleasure then I said behold I come in what the volume of the book it's written of me to do your will O oh God do you understand that every page of the Bible will point us to Jesus I love that story in Acts 8 where Philip is literally translated about 50 miles away And he appears on this road to Damascus. And here comes this Ethiopian heading back to Ethiopia, this Ethiopian eunuch in his chariot. And the the Lord said, I translated you here to talk to this guy. So he goes up and he said, hey, can I get a ride with you? (laughs) He jumps in the chariot and he goes, what are you reading? From that passage he was reading, Philip preached Christ. Now, he had to be in Isaiah 3, which is a great chapter. But it wouldn't matter what chapter. From that passage, the word preach is publicly to declare. Paul made it clear when he came to Corinth. Interesting, if you look in Acts, just been at this amazing place, Athens, at this Mars Hill, and had every God. A, a marker that said to the unknown God, just in case you forgot one, one offend him. And Paul gets up and says, hey, I'd like to talk about this one today, the unknown God. And he preached a very eloquent sermon, quoting all of their various philosophers, and a handful of people got saved. We don't ever have a church started there. After that experience, a good experience for him, he went to Corinth. A man who had been preaching now for years, he said in 1 Corinthians 2, after that experience on Mars Hill, he says this in verse 1. And I, brethren, when I came to you, did not come with excellence of speech or of wisdom, declaring to you the knowledge to the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. I didn't come with eloquent speech like I just did a couple of days ago because it profited nothing. I just came to you raw truth. We are sinners and we need a Savior. And Jesus is that Savior for all sins. It's that simple. He died for our sins according to the Scripture. He was buried. He rose again on the third day according to the Scripture. Believe upon that and you. We know that this warning to every man, it says, I man. You need to warn the unsaved. You know, we don't preach the gospel so good people can be better. We preach the gospel that men will not burn eternally in hell. Do you believe the Bible teaches that? I mean, imagine if, if, if it's flowing a little faster and a little higher than it normally is, and you know this, and you're inner tubing, and you realize, oh my goodness, this thing is, I'm not going to be able to stop at the waterfall if I don't get out. And I get my 
inner tube way earlier and I got all these coming and they're playing and laughing and and I'm like you got to get out no nah, not now I've been here before no not now get out you got to get out or you're going to go over the waterfall you won't be able to get by it's too fast what would you do to stop the multitude for getting ready without Christ there is no hope in this world do you remember what the world was before you came to Christ I, I was 15, 12 to 15, guys. I was in a very, very dark. I came to Christ. It was night and day. It really was. And you know what? Had anybody in those dark years tried to share the Lord with me, I would have been tenderhearted. Even though I was evil and hard-hearted, a lot of evil things at that time, I, I would have listened. And Think of how many people you up before you came to Christ. How many scars you gave. It's okay if you get a scar. It's okay if you get rejected. It's like, oh, I don't know what execution is. I got rejected. Yeah, it, it is. It is a horrible scar. It really is. I don't want to make light of that. It's not the same as getting thrown in the lion's den. But here we need to warn every man. The Holy Spirit's already doing it. In John 16, he says the Holy Spirit convicting men of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Think of that. The Holy Spirit's telling him, you're, you're, you're a sinner and your sins are going to lead to death. And it's going to happen even if you live on paper. And there's, gonna, there's a righteousness and you can have righteousness no matter how good of a person you are. When we go out and share the Lord, most people say, you know how to get to heaven? I, I'm a good person. And I'm trying to be a better person. And I think God understands how sincere and other people say. And the Holy Spirit is already telling them it's not true. I am not sharing anything. I'm just sharing the Holy Spirit saying to them on a regular basis. And their spirit will bear witness with God's spirit. Saying, is the truth that's already been spoken every day and that there is a judgment to come. They're a sinner that can't be righteous as God requires and there's a judgment to come on those that have not received the one way of salvation. It is a part of the truth. John 8.32 says, you'll know the truth and the truth will set you free. We know the truth. In John 3.17, God did not say, the son of the world to condemn the world. That's the truth. Everybody's saying, well, religion is about condemning people. Jesus was not about condemning people. He, he, I don't think in his three years of ministry, he didn't come to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. And he goes on in verse 18 to say, but he who believes in him, but he who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten son of God. Everybody the hell unless it's interrupted by a savior. In verse 19, this is the condemnation that the light of the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. For everyone who practices evil does not come to the light. But the truth comes to the light, his deeds may be clearly seen that they have been done in God. And then John 3, 36, he who believes in the Son has everlasting life. Ah, saved. And he who does not believe the Son shall not see life. Abide by him. I was witnessing a, a few weeks ago, and, and uh, there was these three girls, and, and they were sitting on the, the pier, and brother myself began to share the Lord with them, and they were very open. And the girls in particular were really responding but then this one girl just says, that's enough. And I'm like, what do you mean? Yeah, I, I, I'm bored now. I don't want to hear anymore. And I said, can you tell me the way of salvation? How to have eternal life? Can you, I'll leave here if you can tell your friends. She goes, nope. And I don't, I don't want to go anywhere except where I want to go. And I'm not worried about it. And I just said, before we left, 
said, okay, I will stop talking. But understand, the of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And I walked away. But I, I wanted her to know this wasn't an idea better. This isn't a, a gimmick that you're going to some seminar trying to learn how to become rich, you know, through real estate or something. This is me screaming at you, saying you must get to shore now. In 2 Thessalonians, especially us in these last days, we need to say this. It says the coming of the lawless one, the Antichrist, in 2 Thessalonians 2, he's coming with and all power and signs and lying wonders. We already see deceived. We see it in our own country. That the two groups, the Democrat and Republicans, is almost deceived. Who listen to the lies of the Antichrist and those who will shut it out. It's a scary thing to see and what's happening in guys. It's spiritual. It's happening in every country. It's not just here. It's happening in Canada. It's happening in France. It's happening all over Europe. It's in Satan and his life and this spirit of the Antichrist. And he says, with all unrighteous deception, he's going to come among those who are perishing. They're going to be going, whoa, look at how are going to go, that's, no, that's Satan. That's not God. That's, that's power of hell. And they, it says, they would not receive what? The love of the truth that they might be saved. There's another gospel, the good news. The love of the truth. The gospel is the son who loves us, who died for us. The love of the truth. And it says, for this reason, God sent a strong delusion. You should believe the lie. Believe the truth, but had pleasure and unrighteousness. Do you see how both of those truths make the whole truth? If I didn't go tell everybody God loves you, not really the whole truth. The truth is God loves you and he sent you a savior receive him you have the one way of salvation if you do not then you perish in without the presence of god for eternity but also the bible uh, warns believers so we talk about warning non-believers unbelievers the three years paul pastored in ephesus in acts 20 this is what he did for three years Therefore, three years, I did not cease to warn everyone night and day with what? About the action that's coming. They are going to have to give us themselves an account, as an account to God. Listen to 2 Corinthians 5 and, and how chilling and how powerful, how sobering this is. Verse 9 through 11. Therefore, we make it our aim, whether present or absent, to him in the body or out of the body, dead or alive, to be pleased with Jesus. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. It's the word bema, not the white judgment of condemnation, but the bema seat of rewards or no rewards. That each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he's done, whether good or what? Bad. Knowing, therefore, terror of the Lord, realizing this awesome moment before the Lord, we persuade men, but we are well known to God, and I trust are also known in your conscience. John writes about this in 1 John 2, 28, abide in him. Now, is Christ abiding in us? He most certainly is, isn't he? He's in us. He's abiding in us. We need to abide in him. We, we now need to say, God lives in me, but now it's not enough. I can't just have the Spirit of God. I need to walk now in the Spirit of God. I need to abide in Him. And He says to him that when He appears, you may have confidence and not be ashamed. 
There are some Christians who are going to know I have never borne a believer. I've never denied myself and taken up a cross and followed Christ. I believed in the Lord and I know I'm saved, but I've never truly walked with the Lord for rewards in eternity for the glory of God. Timothy is getting slugged in faith. And Paul he says in 2 Timothy 4, I charge you therefore before the Lord Jesus Christ, even in the dead, is appearing in his kingdom. Timothy, I want you right now to visualize yourself going in front of God on that day of judgment in front of the beam of seat. And he's saying, have you been faithful with being faithful, sharing your faith? Which is a ministry all of us, a work all of us are to do. And he commands him with that in mind, realizing you're going to stand before the beam of seat of Christ. In season and out of season. Paul soberly says in 11 and 12, As I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, every tongue shall confess to God. So then each of us shall give an account of himself to God. Jesus said in Matthew 6, every idle word you're going to have to give an account to. In Luke 8, 17, nothing secret that won't be revealed. Nothing hidden that won't be known. It's going to come to light. I understand what Paul said, knowing the terror of the Lord. Guys, you're going to give an account of every said, even if it was an idle word. You're going to give an account of every deed, whether you thought well enough or not. It's John 2, he says that you don't shrink away in shame at his appearing. Paul talks about this in 1 Corinthians 3. You know this passage well, I think, by now, that he gives an analogy of a house, which is that can't change, because that's the gift of God. Every day, putting bricks on that house, whether you know it or not, it might be a, a, a brick of hay, <laughs> of, of chunks of sawdust. It's, it's not going to withstand the fire of judgment. Or it may be a solid material. No matter how much you hear, it will stay just the off. And so he says in 1 Corinthians 3.13, each one's work will become clear for the day will because it will be revealed by fire. The fire that will test each work of what sort it is if anyone's work he has built on endures he'll receive a ward if anyone's work is burned he will but he saved yet through fire we're all going to have a fiery judgment to speak even as believers and he's going to Set our house on fire, our life that's been built. Here's my life. The money that's gone through my hands. Here's the time that I had. Here's the gifts that you've given me. Here's the freedoms you've given me. Here's the opportunity to share the faith. Here's where I denied myself, took up the cross, and followed you. And, and we're going to have our life that's going to look like a house. And the Lord's going to say, okay, house and put it in the fire. Turn up the heat. <laughs> And he said, he's saying to the Corinthians, what may be left is a foundation of your salvation and no bricks left. We need to warn people of that. Now, I could have picked all the verses that talk about our crowns and our glory, and I've done that, but I'm warning you. Without the cross, there is no following Christ. And he says, we teach every man with all wisdom, teaching. Apostle said, I'm a teacher, and I do this faithfully as a shepherd. In Jeremiah 3.15, God prophesied of this day, I will give you shepherds according to my heart. Line upon line, precept. Paul said again, this there in Acts 20. Proclaimed it. Acts 20. 
that I am innocent of the blood of God. He's going back to tell them that the city is going to be destroyed and, and, and the enemy is going to win and, and tell them to repent or it's going to happen. And he goes like, yeah, it's such a negative thing. I don't like being negative and it's sort of hard to do and people don't like listening to me. And God said, okay, here it is. You don't have to tell them. But the blood that is shed, I'm going to put to your account because you didn't warn them. But if you go warn them and they don't repent and the destruction comes, you're innocent. Your, your hands are washed. You're clean. But you have that destruction's coming. And so Paul I've taught the church through very difficult passages. If you've been through the Bible with us, you know. Everybody's all excited in Genesis. Woohoo! And you get to Leviticus. Ooh, oh, my back hurts. I've got to wash my hair. My dog uh, sniffle up. And then, you know, you get out of the Leviticus numbers, Deuteronomy. Joshua, I'm here for the first six chapters. And then it gets a little hard. And then judges, oh, they're back. And then we have a good time for a while uh, through the kings and stuff. But Paul says, man, I, I got you through it. And then I, I, love, ex, I love Nehemiah in, in chapter 8. It, it talks about how once the wall was and they built a stage, a pulpit, and, and Ezra came up and, and he began to teach from the word. But I love that. And it says that all the Levites, all the, the teachers, all the scribes were there. And it says, distinctly from the book of the law of God, they gave the sense and helped them understand the reading. That's what I'm doing right now. I'm trying to give you guys a sense of it, and I do it in a rather long-winded way. Sorry about that. But uh, it's just that you can go and read your Bible today, chapter verses 25 through 29, and go, oh, mystery, I know what that is. Shep, oh, I know what that is. Servant, oh, I know what you, you, you can read it and know it. And then he said that we might present every man perfect in Christ Jesus or, or under completion to get you there. Chuck used to always say, my goal is to make Calvary Chapel the sheep on the planet. And then you get healthy sheep, but you got to get for the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry. Not for them doing the work. Saints to do the work. With the knowledge of the Son of God to a perfect man, to the measure, the stature, I love this, of the fullness of Christ until we are no longer be chosen to and fro, carried about by every wind of doctrine, by trickery of men and cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting, but speaking the truth in love, hard sometimes to hear, but you speak it in love, may grow up and things into him who is the head of Christ. So I present every man perfect in Christ. I labor to do things. And then finally in verse 29 today, to I also according to his working, he works in me, Notice this. To the, he has a clear goal. He has a focus. He's, if he gets discouraged, he knows how to get right back on track. If he loses focus, he knows exactly where he needs to get going again. He, he says, I labor. Look at these words. I labor. This Greek word is to work unto exhaustion. You're plowing the field and you pass out. <laughs> Somebody carries you in, you sleep, you get up, you plow the field until you pass out. Paul tells us in 1 Thessalonians, verse 3, remain without ceasing your work of faith, and here it is, your labor of love. It's work to love people. People aren't that loving. Love the unlovable is a lot of work, isn't it? And, and you know, when I go into the grocery store, I'm trying to love on people. Get some, like, you're a weirdo, and yeah, that's it. I quit. I'm done. I'm just going to be the guy I want to be. You know, get out of my way. I don't know. You know, and, and 
No, it's, it's a love, it's labor. Verse 5, 12 through 13, and we urge you, brethren, to recognize those who, those who are laboring among you and discourage how you live, how you walk and, 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 and the Lord. And 1 Timothy 4, and to this end, we both labor. 17. Word of God and prayer. 6, 10 through 12. God is not unjust to forget your love, which you have shown towards his name. Full assurance of hope until the end. But in faith and patience are at the promise. I, I see that as a pastor. People have teens that leave the church. That's it. They're going to college whether they're living in the house or not. It seems like I went to church club to be heathen. I went to church for them. But now that I'm not taking kids to church every Sunday, I'm not motivated to do it anymore. Now that I'm not teaching Sunday school, I just don't want to go to church anymore. Now that it's just for me, no spiritual desire. And marriages are that way, right? As soon as the kids leave the house, the two people are looking at each other going, we've lived in the same house, but I don't know you. It's all been about the kids, the kids, and we haven't kept our marriage uh, ablaze. But the same with the Lord. And he's saying, you need to keep it to the end. You need to keep going till the end. Don't become sluggish. The word striving there is the word agonizomai. We get our word agonize. According to the working which works in me mightily. God's grace is sufficient. Paul said, I labor more than all, but it's not I, it's the grace of God. Sufficient for these things, Paul says, nobody, but God makes us sufficient. Finishing up, verse 10 through gift. Minister to one another with that gift as good stewards of the man of God. If he speaks, let him speak. Anyone minister to God supplies things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ to whom belong the glory dominion ever and ever. I exhort you today to strive, to agonizomai, to labor out of love for God, out of for his church, a lost and dying world. Don't become sluggish. Don't slow down. You're going to the end. And the grace of God is there. If you'll wake up, it says in that God has a work of art that he's prepared ahead of time. Good work. And God's predicted as a blessing. The moment you believe, you become the elect. And all of God's elect are predestined good works every day. There's a hundred whether you do 20% or 60%, there's a hundred percent. If you abide in him as he's abiding in you, walk in the spirit, take up the cross, be willing to, to, to lose your life in order to gain the rest of the world, dying is present to me that life would be in everyone else. You will walk in a hundred percent of the good works. And then through the power, through the love, for love, through love, walk in that grace. Um, Christ, as God desires.